To my right, I have Ilya Rolovich. He uh, is with Engine Group, our gold level sponsor. And his talk is Tokenized Gaming Multiverse Tokens. One thing you may not know about him is his favorite token is named Mike. So you should definitely ask uh, the story behind that token because for me, it's actually very interesting. Uh, so find him later and ask. Please welcome him. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm actually the Chief Marketing Officer at Engine, and we've been in the gaming industry since 2009. And a couple of years ago, we kind of started working on um, ecosystem for game developers, for, for mainstream game developers. So we're not talking about your web-based games, your web-based crypto games of today. We're talking about World of Warcraft. We're talking about League of Legends, games like that. So our first step on the journey, essentially, was to create a new type of token. And it came in the form of ERC-1155. It's a multi-token standard that was created by our CEO, Rita Kradomsky. And here's what it does. So you have a ERC-20 that has some, and ERC-721, they have some fundamental limitations because you need a separate contract for each token class. So if I have a game like World of Warcraft that has like 100,000 different token types, you have swords, pets, stuff like that. You need a separate contract for every single token. And for mainstream games, you need both fungible and non-fungible tokens. So you have fungible tokens like, I don't know, gold, even mineable ore <coughs> resources, stuff like that, or even generic loot items like swords and stuff, but you also have non-fungible items like, I don't know, characters or pets or anything that can be modified by the player with the uh, unique items. So uh, your C1155 basically enables you to mint, to create, um, infinite amount of uh, both fungible and non-fungible tokens with a single smart contract. And there's some really good stuff that you can do on top of it. So you can you can build advanced features on top of it. You can allow players to loan their items. They can easily, more easily trade them. Like for example, you can do, yeah, you can also say, yeah, but you can do atomic swaps that only use two steps instead of four, for example. You can do multi-transfers. For example, if I want to send, um, sword and a potion to Johnny and um, I know a helmet and a um, book to Mary. I can do that with a single transaction and I can save gas. Yeah, I, I, and, and you can also do some advanced features like for example, enabling players to rent tokens. Like if I'm playing a game, I don't know, I'm going on a trip, I can just rent out my character easily, you know. You can also save gas because you only need one smart contract to, to for, for each um, token type. And if you want to add tokens, you're not actually deploying a new contract, you're just calling a function. So you can save up to like 90% of gas when minting new tokens. Um, yeah, I talked about atomic swaps, multi-transfers. And so every digital asset that's created with our platform is an ERC-1155 token that's backed with Engine Point. And that's the, that's actually the value backing part of my talk. So, and there's a really good, there's a really good reason for it. So. Imagine if you're a gamer, you spend 10,000 hours playing a game, you spent maybe thousands of dollars on that game, and the game dies. Developers just, maybe maybe the studio went bankrupt, maybe it's a server-based game like Minecraft or Rust, and it all went to, you know, it, 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 it all disappeared, and you're left with nothing. And our way of solving that is offering insurance in the form of value backing that asset. So you have a sword, it's created, with something of value, which is engine coin. So gamers can actually melt it back in the worst possible scenario that if the game died, or maybe the player got bored and can't easily sell the item. You know, like usual scenario would be, okay, I'm, I'll go on a marketplace, I'll just sell it for, I know, 20, 100 times its result value. But in the worst possible scenario, I can melt it back and I can pull that value back either my time or my money or both. So, which actually creates consumer trust. So if you have an item that's already insured, that has a reserve value, I as a gamer, as a consumer, I'm more likely to purchase it because I know there's a sort of a insurance bar to it. And there's also some other stuff, like there's, there's, a, there's the perceived value of an item. Let me give you an example, actually. So we have around 12 early adopter studios that are building on top of our platform. And what we kind of noticed is that 
more unique items or more rare items or items that have like really high stats, they're using more engine to, to bag them. So kind of that, that uh, actual intrinsic value of item is kind of mimicked with its backed value. That's what they're doing right now. So ERC-1155 tokens backed by engine coin are almost real. They're not obviously real, but you get two core properties of the tangible <laughs> item. You can destroy them, like unlike ERC-721, for example, which can be kind of destroyed, you can lose it, you know, but you can actually melt an ERC-1155 token, so you can actually destroy it. And the second core property, it's made out of something, which is kind of the property of a tangible item. So, and now I'm actually coming to our ecosystem. So we, we kind of have everything you need to like create, manage, store, explore, distribute, blockchain-based assets, and well integrate them. Our first product was um, cryptocurrency wallet. We launched it in January this year. And we did a lot of work on it since then. It's your regular cryptocurrency wallet, so it supports Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, stuff like that. But it's also made for ERC-721 and ERC-1155 items. It has native support for ERC-1155 items. So here you can actually see Mike. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a token that you can use in multiple games. So six or seven games, for example, which I'll talk about in a minute. So um, we have the Engine Explorer, Engine X for short, which will actually come out in the next couple of weeks, maybe I think even next week, depends, uh, which is also like a generalized blockchain explorer, but that will also support ERC-1155 items. It, its API is actually already powering our wallet. Um, and it will support like um, gaming items, so you can you can actually see here, people, like gamers will be able to actually check out on the blockchain all the details they'll they'll need. Like for example, the backed uh, value and engine, but also metadata like item stats and stuff like that, or like it, the the items picture. Uh, we have something called the Engine Mint, which is super simple at the moment. It's it's basically a shop where you can order custom minted uh, ERC eleven fifty five tokens. We have plans to make it uh, basically a self service where you can just use a graphical interface to easily mint assets. And we have the Beam. So this is this is our kind of token distribution service. If you have the engine wallet or if you want to download it right now on your smartphone, you can just scan this code and you'll actually get a token, more or less instantly, um, just by scanning the code. We needed it a couple of months back because um, we did a giveaway and we're like, okay, so we need to distribute 2,000 tokens. We're not going to do this manually, we need a system. So what we did is we developed this. There were also some flyers with uh, actually a different QR code that you might have scanned. So at the core of our ecosystem is the engine platform, which is kind of an umbrella term for uh, various tools and services that will provide for game developers. So kind of we have we have the engine cloud, which is your kind of hub for communicating uh, between blockchain and uh, our suite of smart contracts and, and the game server. So the way that you can interact with it is a GraphQL API, and you can do it directly. For example, if you want to use, I don't know, Unreal Engine or something. But you'll also be able to use our Unity SDK, which will come out sometime in Q1 2019. And it will feature a graphical user interface for creating tokens, for managing users, stuff like that. But you'd use a runtime API for game logic, like, I know, if a player defeats a dragon, send him a blockchain token, stuff like that. So here's a, here's a couple of screenshots of the, of the actual graphical user interface. You, you, you'll be able to use, uh, for example, Coman to test it out for free play around a bit. Uh, you, can, you can see a list of all your fungible and non-fungible items. You can easily create them. There's, there's some certain variables that hook into our smart contracts, like for example, the supply, uh, the supply type, which can be collapsing, fixed, increasing, uh, like five or six types, you, you can you can even do a um, custom one based on a smart contract. So, for example, let's say you have um, let's say you have a character a token, and you want the number of actual minted tokens to correspond to the number of actual users in the game. So you can go like, okay, for every user, do do an increasing supply of one, or you can do um, you, you can actually do a collapsing. So this example here is. Um, 
is in uh, is a fungible item that has a collapse collapsing supply. So if we have a total supply of 100, if somebody melts them down, that means there's going to be 99. Nobody else will be able to mint. Well, you won't be able to mint, uh, or anyone will be able to mint a uh, new token. So you have a collapsing supply. Supply types are there because you have you have you need you need different types of choices that game designers can make when they're building game economies, which is extremely important, especially if you add the additional variable of blockchain into this combination. So this is a non-fungible item, for example. Um, and we have a we have a wallet daemon, which is just basically a console. It's a server-side wallet for automating uh, large volume transaction requests. So because you don't want to, you know, manually uh, prove every single transaction to a, a gamer, uh, and you just use this. And we have Affinity, which is our layer two scaling solution uh, for performing highly scalable token transactions. I could go a long while about this, but. What I am going to say is that eventually it, was, it will support infinite amount of transactions that remain trustless and verified on the Ethereum main chain. So uh, our entire platform is crafted for the gaming industry. Like our, our goal, we want to see we want to see games that are mainstream built by AA, AAA studios using blockchain technology. Like a couple of months ago, for example. We became part of the blockchain game alliance with Ubisoft, for example. And there's some other stuff that you can actually do when you when you put blockchain with with mainstream with 3D games. There's some other stuff that you can do. But let me let me start with kind of kind of value stuff that I want to talk about. So you can create games that have player-driven value creation, but it, it's it's a it's a different way of monetizing games. So let's take this axe, for example. Let's say that a player created it with a couple of pieces of wood and iron. Let's say that another player who maybe spent six months just pumping up his, let's say, enchanting stats for six months and then enchanted his axe. Let's say that a third player who's maybe a talented artist created a um, skin for this axe. Let's say that this axe has only one engine and it's back value, which is nothing, which is a couple of cents. Actual intrinsic price, the, the market value of such an axe, just because of player input, would be way, way higher. Maybe 100, maybe 1,000 times higher. So you, you, could, you could, essentially what you could do, you could create a game, a sandbox game, for example. You could enable players to create something. It doesn't matter if it's building, buildings, just any sort of player input. One example that I really love to use is an example of a talking sword that fires off each time a certain variable is a certain value. Like if you're low on mana, the sword would go, oh, you're low on mana, stuff like that. So what you can actually do, you can, you can, so here's, here's what's happening in the mainstream gaming industry right now. Around 40%, roughly, of gaming revenue is lost to gray market trading. Uh, this means that gamers are trading on platforms that are not owned or controlled by game developers and they are losing, like the, the industry as a whole is losing around 100 billion a year, which is kind of a problem and it also fuels some other unwanted behavior like hackers and fraud because they can easily sell what they steal on third party platforms. So with blockchain you can actually totally cut that behavior out. You can whitelist certain wallets and you can enforce blockchain trading fees, which means that the X in the previous example, I can get maybe a two or three percent trading fee of it. And I can re-monetize <laughs> something that I would basically lose money before. And you, there, there's also some cool implications for crowdfunding. So if you look at traditional crowdfunding, like for example, Kickstarter, there's, there's more than one example where game developers actually got funded and they didn't deliver. So gamers were left with nothing. And what you can do, for example, is you can pre-mint, you can create your, so instead, for example, offering t-shirts and mugs as back rewards, you can actually create your gaming assets in advance. You can bag them with engine coin and you can get, you can offer insurance to gamers. So even if you don't deliver, they're still left with something. In the worst case, case scenario, they can melt it back to engine coin. In the best possible scenario, even if you don't deliver, they might trade it as a collectible of sorts, maybe. 
you know. So, but the, the, the actual most <laughs> exciting stuff, at least for me, that, that we kind of did and, and made possible in the, in the last couple of months is a gaming multiverse. So, I don't know if any of you have seen Ready Player One, but it's kind of like that. So, the, the basic idea is that you can take your characters and items across multiple games. So, for example, I'm playing Skyrim. I got to level 15, I, I want to jump with the, that same character, that same items in another game and continue playing there. So what we did is we kickstarted the, the, the first gaming multiverse. And it's, it's super basic right now, there's around I think six to eight games, just share items, that's it. A couple of, couple of uh, characters maybe, but around 10 to 12 items, they, they, they are usable across games. Like for example, this is one of the items that you can use um, across games. Also, the, the stuff that uh, we're giving away via the engine beam stuff is also two, game, two, two items that you can use across multiple games. So, and this is like the, the most basic, basic stuff, but the cool stuff that you can do, you can, for example, enable leveling, which is what I just talked about. It's fairly complicated because for, especially for RPG games, the balance of those games can be really <laughs> can be really bad if you if you implement something like this. But there's some solutions. Like for example, you can just use a single variable, which can be like a total playtime across all games, and then you can tie that to some advantage in game. Like for for a game where you really don't want to break the in-game mechanic, it can be just a cosmetic advantage. You know, like something that's not actually giving you any any you know advantage in battle or something like that. You can also do quests. So what we did with the first gaming multiverse, there's there's like this main multiverse quest which will involve going across a bunch of games, collecting sort of Easter eggs and clues, and then you'll be able to get an item which is called the monolith and has or one million engine, which is not a lot, but it's not so you know <laughs> it's not so modest. But there's, there's actually a really good like meta-narrative story behind all this. But you can also do some sort of interesting quest, like I like to call them like side quests and loot quests. Like you can have game one where you can grab a key and you'd use that key in a, in a different game to let's say open a chest. Then grab a sword which you can use in a game number three to slay a dragon and then you get an item brought from a dragon which you can use in game one. So you like, kind of completed the full circle, and the whole point besides the kind of game designers having fun uh, of gaming multiverses is, is a couple of things. First, you can save money on user acquisition because you have a shared pool, a shared user, user pool. So if a new game is joining the, the multiverse, they can go, okay, so hey guys, you can just jump straight in. You already have the items, you can just start playing. Stuff like that. You could also argue that you get. So here's here's another thing. So there's a layer of insurance that you get with your items being backed with engine coin. You can melt them back. But there's also a layer of insurance that you get from being able to use items in multiple games. Because let's say I have a sword, I can use it in ten games. Even if two games fail, even if two games fail, I still get to maybe sell that sword because it's usable in eight more games. And you can also, yeah, here's mine, for example. <laughs> you can also do uh, non-player characters. So you can, you, can, you can play around a lot. This is more fun stuff. You, you could actually build a smart contract that owns itself and that can own cryptocurrency. And that could use that crypto to, let's say, pay other players to do its bidding <laughs> or upgrade its stats, buy new equipment. So eventually you'd maybe end up with something like Skynet taking over a couple of games or something like that. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna end up with, so even though we're, we're, building, a, we're building a gaming ecosystem, like this is, this is totally crafted for gaming. But in the last couple of months, there, there has been a lot of talk and ideas going around on and applying the same principles and kind of ideas across multiple industries. And I'm just gonna talk about one example, and that's uh, because I'm a marketer, I deal with a lot of you know software that you need to get like uh, an annual subscription for. So more often than not, when I try something out, okay, we got an annual subscription. Two months later, I'm like, oh, okay, battle with support for I don't know one month so we can get a refund. So one alternative idea 
that I kind of really like is you could you could basically tokenize the subscription. You know, so if I'm if I don't want to use that software anymore, I can just sell the token. And you can use the same multiverse analogy for gaming. You could use that for software. So I could get a software bundle, basically a multiverse of software as a service products, which would kind of have a really cool intrinsic value because I'm getting one token, one token, and um, subscription for everything. So um, thank you all for listening. You can scan the code here. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website. You can visit our blog. You can check out the ERC-1155 token standard on GitHub. It's, um, I think it's in the last call phase. So in a couple of weeks, it's going to be finalized. As a reminder, uh, you can ask questions on Slido or raise your hand. Joe, is this already in production? Is it, uh, is somebody already been using this ending point or? Yes, yeah, so we we launched an early adopters program um, sometime during the summer. There's already, I think, twelve games have announced so far. They're they're building it. They're they're building on top of our platform. So the first game that announced was War of Crypto, which is a simple mobile game. You know, something like let's say Clash of Clans or Clash of Clans, something like that. There's a couple of really high quality games, like for example, uh, Nine Lives Arena. If you if you look at it, it's full 3D. It's on, it's in Unreal. It kind of looks like a AAA game, and it has a really good, like, unique, uh, unique value proposition because it has permanent death. So if you, if you die nine times, your character is gone, which which is really cool. And one of the reasons our kind of whole crypto token um, framework really works because the actual token is melted down. You know, all they're all they're left with is um, kind of a statue of uh, of a character after that. But yeah, people, studios, gaming studios are already using uh, our stuff. So right now, there's uh, only the GraphQL API and Unity SDK is for our early adopters. It's not public. Uh, sometime early next year, we're we're going to release the Unity first uh, open beta. Or maybe even closed one. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but it's going to be public in Q1 uh, 2019. Okay, so I have to so can I answer that question? So, for example, if you have an existing game that is already on no cloud popular, can you just add an engine core on top of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 could totally do that. It depends on depends on. Well, actually, it doesn't matter because you can still use the GraphQL API for any sort of. Let's say if it's built in Unreal, but if it's Maybe with Unity it would be easier because we do we, we will have an SDK out in a couple of months. You said uh, you mentioned World of Warcraft, and I'm wondering how do you how do the game developers handle nerves uh, using your platform? So you said you get a sword, you put that sword in chain, and it's all okay, but then uh, because of the balance in the game, okay. they decide to nerve stuff. So it's a drastical change in talents and steps and you know it takes P uh, you, mean, you, mean, you mean if if you have a same item across multiple games or I'm I am i am talking in let's say World of Warcraft topics and they decide to say like uh, intelligence it's not intelligence anymore, it's something else and it works a different way and you have the source store there and they nerfed it. So how do you have any experience? I think he means to ask, like, would, uh, how do you change the item's properties? Yeah. Like, you know, if, if an item is too strong you... right now, how do you make it weaker? Like, if it's killing Okay, yes, yeah, so, I mean, with your C1155, you can, you, can, uh, you can actually augment the items. But uh, you're, you're actually asking on how, how would you make the item weaker? Or stronger. Or change, More stronger. Or well, it, 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 it just depends on the metadata. You know, it can be easily changed. So you get you get sort of strings for I don't know. Let's say item level. You would just make it seven instead of ten, or something like that. You know. I mean, like honestly, it's 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 not such it's not a big issue as much as it's balancing across games. Like the balancing across games is a couple of hours just staring at the blank blank screen and going. Oh hell! I want this, but it's super complicated. So, so, like the only solution that I would kind of 
managed to came up with is using time as a variable, like total play time across all games. And maybe, you know, like just using cosmetics for some certain, like for example, just the, the example, the, the Nine Lives Arena. That game has really complicated progression system. You know, it's a hardcore RPG. So you wouldn't be able to, to use a, you know, like to, to use a character from a different game, for example, that you can level up in a different game, but it will totally break the balance of that game. So uh, the next question was, yeah. Yeah, my question concerns, what do you think the effect on uh, game loops is going to be? On game? On game loops. So for instance, games define their own sets of ritualistic behavior, right? So okay. there are certain things that need to be repeated in a game. And uh, when you push the game towards, when you push the assets in the game towards having real life value, you get various adverse sometimes even effects. So for instance, the slur of a Chinese gold farmer is rooted in reality because of the fact that in-game assets have real life value, which then instructs certain people with enough access to fiat capital, let's call it, to exploit the gamers in order to produce these internal assets. So yeah, question, yeah, how I, does this tie in I get, I get the question. So, so the, the, there's, there's two things. So you do have to understand uh, the, the whole um, bot industry basically is fueled by free market trading. You know, because those Chinese bars, they can go on a third party platform, they can sell it for fiat. With our platform, you can enforce blockchain trading fees. Okay, but you so. Can melt the assets down. So my uh, no, no, okay, okay, yeah, I get the question, I get the question. So, uh, to give you a simple example, you don't have to use a significant amount of engine coin, it can be nominal. You know, it could take them one year to get one dollar. It, it really, it, it's, it's more about, it's more about actually using blockchain as a technology to facilitate new kinds of gameplay and to ensure some like security and uh, just gamers being free from fraud and from like precisely when it comes to, to for example, fraudulent activity. The main problem is gray market trading because they, they all have the incentive just because they can trade off platforms. So if you have bars that you can ban, you could ban them everywhere. You know, you could just say, okay, this address, they can't trade anymore. That's it, you know? But the way that I would say that would be like foolproof is if you built a game where you didn't have player driven Creation. So you wouldn't have, okay, I'm just going to grind for, you know, two or three hours and get, I don't know, 100,000 gold or something. You would get a game, okay, so I'm going to sit down and maybe write a lore piece about this game, or I'm going to record a voice clip, or I'm going to build an actual castle. Because those in-game items actually have some sort of intrinsic value. You know, like if, if you get a rare drop, okay, it has it has a intrinsic value just based on rarity. But if you actually build a castle in Minecraft and spend like, I know, six months building it, its intrinsic value is way, way higher. You know, if you know, if you know what I mean. How do you plan on translating that intrinsic value to actual monetary value, right? If I do not- Market, it, 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 it's, just, it's just market. You know, you have a marketplace, if, if an item, is sought after, it will have a high market value. Okay, so my question is, I'm going to end after this, is then I don't quite understand the paradox, which is you say that you can denominate the app, the in-game asset in the coin, and it can be a very, very low denomination, which means the axe is worth a euro, okay. Say. But then as users add this so-called intrinsic value to this, what mechanism governs the fact that I can now get a hundred euros for this axe, how can I, in reality or in fiat, increase the value? Or is the value stuck and burned into the game itself so that there's no way for the intrinsic value to meet So up? you'd implement a trading fee, so let's say if I, if I have an axe, it's, it, it has one engine reserve value. I'm selling it for 100. If the trading fee is, let's say 5%, the game developer would get the trading fee. There's actually, there's actually kind of, there's two types of trading fees. One is where you, the, the actual gamer would get 95, the developer would get five. The other one is where the gamer would sort of pay the trading fee, where the, the one, so gamer would get 100, the developer would get five. 
You know, it's, it's just two, two, two types of trading fees. Uh, what's the difference between ERC-1155 as opposed to the Crypto Zombies team ERC-721X? There's a kind of philosophy that we're, that we're pushing with, with value backing of digital assets. The, the main difference I would say is that you'd use, well, at least in our ecosystem, in our platform, you'd use Engine to back an ERC-1155 token. Because the alternative is putting the whole game on blockchain. You know, you need insurance for gamers. You know, you want if the if the developers want to, you know, over monetize the game or push it in a different direction than the gaming community will like. So one idea, which sounds really good ideologically, but is is not good in practice, is to put everything you, you put everything on blockchain. So then gamers can basically fork the game. But that limits you when it comes to games. You can just build kind of turn based games essentially. You know, and if you do the op well, not the opposite. If you if you just put items on blockchain, if you bag them with value, you still get the same benefits. So gamers have insurance, but you're not limited by any means. You can build up an MMO with million players, and you're not limited by by blockchain speed essentially. You know, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Another question, are there any competitors in the same market that you're in? Well, I mean, sort of and sort of no, because we're really focused on, on mainstream gaming. You know, like right now, I mean, I'm, I'm a marketer, so the way that I see it, there's two core audiences. There's blockchain developers that are building games, and there's game developers that might want to build blockchain games. The, the actual second audience uh, is really hard to get to, if I'm being honest, because gaming industry as a whole has um, sort of a negative perception of, of blockchain due to increased prices of GPUs in January, if you all remember. You know, so a typical gamer, if he hear, hears Bitcoin, he's like, RX 580, I hate you guys. You know, so so that that but that said, on on events like GDC or Unite events across the world, we, we had really good feed, feedback from from mainstream game developers. You know, like people are kind of realizing that the tech is not just oh, so you want gamers to mine Bitcoin. It's more about okay, so I can build a Ready Player One type uh, universe, which is actually decentralized which is way better than the actual movie solution because that's not a good idea. What do you think about esports and uh, how can blockchain make uh, esports better? I'm not, I'm not that much into esports. I, I, do, I do watch Let's Players on YouTube, Twitch not so much. Uh, I think that esports is, is um, definitely super interesting in terms of, in terms of what, what uh, game developers could do when collaborating with actual streamers. So I'm, I'm more looking at this from a marketing perspective. So you could maybe have a system where you'd have blockchain fees being paid to uh, being paid to Twitchers based on installs straight from Twitch, you know, which is which is kind of kind of interesting. But in terms of like as a gamer, yeah, I mean, I, I did I dig esports, although I much prefer actually playing games than just to watching them. Can items be traded on the platform for arbitrary web value? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 you have to understand this. There's already uh, gaming items. They are centralized. They are traded for thousands of dollars. You know, they are not blockchain items. Like you have, you have gamers buying uh, buying spaceships from from Star Citizen for three or four thousand dollars, trade from developers. So not actually on the market but but from developers yeah. so like the, the the actual value of of digital items is not so much in in here's the thing every every single time that i talked about that i talk about that value people assume that a gaming item would be traded for that exact value and that value is there just as an insurance of sorts for more reasons as well like for example hyperinflation you know like you can print infinite amount of ERC-721 tokens. You know, there's nothing stopping you. If you have a limited resource that you can use, there's something that can curb hyperinflation for tokens. There's more than one reason to, to 
value back your your gaming items or anything else. Like as I as I said, there's there's potentially infinite applications of the platform of the world. And those those items exist right now on engine and for higher than yeah. Those are ERC eleven fifty five items. Like uh, quite recently, um, I think Cats and Max they minted like twenty thousand or something like items, and they're on the platform right now. So yeah, yeah, they're they're ERC eleven fifty five tokens. You know, so they save a lot of gas fees. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's say an item has a fixed engine value, okay. and engine tokens. That's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that's that value is more like an insurance value. Yes. Yeah. But players can trade those items without using the engine. Well, honestly, it totally depends on the legal stuff for a certain country. Like, for example, in Korea, you kind of have this cryptocurrency ban. We, we kind of have a whole another, like we have something called Engine K for Korea, for, for example, where, where players actually can't trade items at all because it's super illegal, at least for now in, in Korea. And they, they, all, all the game developers would do in our platform there is maybe facilitate a gaming multiverse or something. But to actually answer your question, the trading would be done in, I don't know, even fiat, depending on the legal framework, actually. But engine coin, no, no. To, to answer, it doesn't have to be engine. It can be anything. Like, generally speaking, I wrote, if, if, you, want, if you want to read, uh, you can check out a blog. I wrote two articles on blockchain game monetization, and I kind of am speculating on how the whole, well, industry as a whole, how it will evolve in terms of how payments are made in, in what currency. I think that right now and for a while, we'll see a transitional period where fiat is used. So you you play a regular game, you'd use, I don't know, 50 bucks or whatever to buy a package or something. The, the only difference between what's happening right now is because if I'm a game developer, let's say I'm a, I'm a big corporation, I'm responsible to my shareholders and I don't care about actual game design. All I care is about making money. And I do hardcore monetization. Even if I do that, you could argue that the game is fairer because if gamers are buying something that they can easily sell, so here's the main difference is that you can easily and legally sell it. So for, for games right now, big MMOs, <coughs> trading is usually either restricted or illegal based on their terms of service. This is what we're kind of doing is getting developers to implement technology straight into their games so that gamers, both gamers and game developers actually win, you know? Okay, but doesn't uh, the insurance part of engine, doesn't it create the downward pressure on the token market? What do you mean downward pressure on the token? Because, let's say, the Chinese farmer, the item farmer, he creates... Games like pressure. that would fail. So a simple, a simple answer to that question, okay, I'm a game developer, I make a game where I enable people to pull out value instantly, games like that would fail. You know, we're doing our best to educate game developers on best practices when it comes to designing games, you know? So yeah, I, I completely agree, there's, there's always a risk that you could do a poor game design and use a ton of edge. That said, you could do nominal amounts. So you could spend, I don't know, 10 bucks worth of engine coin for a trillion items or something like that. So you don't actually have that that, exa that exact problem. The, the, don't, don't think in terms of money. Think in terms of what the technology can do. You know, it, it's more about the tech. It's more about making gaming more fair and purposeful than, than actually, okay, let's make a new payment solution. We already have payment solutions that work today even though I personally don't like them and I imagine that most of this room does not like fiat currency that much you know but I mean thermal layer yeah sure why not you know but in the next year or something I, I honestly don't see transactions being done in crypto for mainstream gaming you know like because you have this huge user experience problem that you have to solve you know, like gamers, okay, yeah, they tend to be techy. They can, like, when it comes to our wallets, for example, I can imagine a 14-year-old using it easily, you know, but it's gonna take some time, you know, to, to actually nail it and 
solve every single user experience problem. I have a question. Do you think that, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, I mean, it's trading. Okay. So basically, uh, and you mentioned illegal trades that, that are happening actually. And they are ruining the, ruining the game experience. So don't you think that introducing this kind of model would ruin the game experience? For instance, if I can get a token or a sword that's in that token and I can buy it for some other value, is it uh, euros or bitcoin or whatever, uh, isn't that pay to win model? It's absolutely pay to win. Uh, but I here's mean, the, here's I the thing. The gamer would like uh, pay on it. No, no, yes, absolutely. Because as I said, I as I said, I need to invest 10,000 uh, 10, 10, hours to get the white saber tooth tiger, and <laughs> right, my white saber tooth tiger, and then you uh, just throw in and buy that with uh, I, the same, say, like, the same uh, rules that that apply to mainstream games of today would apply to games that are built on top of engine platform. So short. Sure, reply to a question. A game like that would fail, except maybe in Korea yeah. or, or Asian markets where you have that pay to win model is kind of normal, yeah. you know. But kind of Europe, USA, pay to win generally tends to get a lot of downloads in Reddit, yeah, you know. So models. it's it's up to game, it's up to game developers, you know. Okay. Like uh, oh, our our platform right now is mostly used by small indies, medium indies, that still have that kind of creative drive. It's not beaten out of them by years of corporate stuff. So so they're doing a really good job on, on making sure that stuff is fair, you know? So but yeah, I mean of course you don't want to you don't want to make your game pay to win. Yeah. The ideal situation in my opinion is if you don't have a game that has players that can't create something is that you just make cosmetics tradable. You know, and you have in mind, you don't have to tokenize everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can have your gold in game, you can have it a regular yeah. centralized item or something. You can just tokenize enough of characters, yeah, wow. for example, you know. Okay, okay. Uh, so that would be it, folks. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>